Jeff uh, is the VP of product at Flexport. In his role, he brings together industry and technology expertise across the organization to create products that help companies navigate an increasingly complex global trade environment through technology. Before Flexport, Jeff was the vice president of loyalty technology products at Merkel, uh, helping direct retailers, brands, mobile gaming, and sports teams build relationships with their customers through the Loyalty Plus platform. Before that, he was CTO of Wine.com, where Jeff built a customer-focused product team revolutionizing how people discover, buy, and enjoy wine. And since he's done a ton of stuff in B2B and B2C, in his talk today, he's going to give us some insights on what he's learned about all that. So big round of applause for Jeff. Thank you, Javid and, and Skip Card for allowing us to host. Um, you know, we're trying to bring the community into Flexport you know, and support product and technology. So thank you all for coming and, and, and seeing our space. Um, hope you uh, learn a lot and enjoy your evening. First of all, you know, the talk here is sort of an, a call to action for you to make time to listen to your customer. Uh, but before we get into that, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what is Flexport because everybody you know, tonight I talked to asked this. So, so first of all, we're a company trying to revolutionize global trade. So what is global trade? You know, global trade is a circulatory system for the whole world's economy. We, we move goods from factories to buyers. We have to orchestrate this movement. The, the, the goods, it's a relay race between those goods and really legacy documents. This one called the Bill of Lading, it was created in the 13th century, right? And so it's still in the same format in paper. So we'll talk a little bit about that with what, how our customs team's working on, working on automating this. But we have to make sure that the consignee, the buyer and the seller all communicate through all these digital forms. And our mission is to make global trade easier for everybody in trade. And there's a lot of stakeholders, you'll see this later. Um, so, so that's, first of all, what Flexport is. Um, now in my journey to get to B2B, uh, I, you know, I've learned a lot and um, the first thing I'm gonna ask everybody is, is did anybody here talk to their customer this week? Oh, we got one, one or two hands. How about in the last month? All right, a few more, right? And, uh, and, and really part of being product is being the voice of the customer. Um, and, and it's a challenging thing to, to be, right? You, you have to really get inside the mind of your customer. And, and a lot of times we get so, so laser focused in our work that we forget to do that. And you know, I've talked to a few of my colleagues and they're, they're like, I need to talk to more customers, right? So how do I get there? So I started out in, in B2C and you know, the Silicon Valley you know, theme is move fast, break things, right? Let's test and learn, test and learn, do many experiments, learn fast. Uh, you know, in B2C, it's, it's really easy to do that and get stuck in this zone, right? And, and, and test and test and test. Um, uh, but in, in B2B, you gotta slow down. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, in, in, in my past, you know, we were focused on the wrong metrics, maybe top line, right? And just growing more and more revenue, more and more eyeballs. And, and you make big mistakes. In our case, we were hemorrhaging money, right? Burning money. Um, and, and of course, at some point that comes to an end and, and change happens. Um, and, and luckily we got back to consumer focus, right? And instead of going after money and building more partnerships and buying ads on, on different, different um, uh, properties, you know, we, we asked, what does the customer need? So we went and out and talked to those customers. Um, you know, luckily the private equity firm that took us over hired BCG to help us. And so they came out with large selection good value and fast on time delivery, not so different from Amazon. Um, and, uh, and so we use this as our, our North star. Um, and, and the first thing we did was like, okay, we've got all this traffic, it's burning. Why is it burning? And, and one of the interesting things is after prohibition, um, states got to, 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 buy, to select where all their goods were from. And so in every state, we had to have a warehouse, which is silly for an e-commerce company. And so one of the first things we did was listen to our customers through data. And we looked at where the funnel was breaking. And lo and behold, you know, we thought from our vanity metrics that conversion was great. But when we dove a little deeper and listened to our customers through data, we saw that in California it was great. In all the other states it was bad. And so we got to the bottom of it. 
and we had a lot of ideas and we got to test and learn really fast, right? Because we had a big audience. So one, one of the uh, team members said, hey, why don't we put an advertising paywall up there and see what happens? So we did. And we put this thing up that you know, allowed us to test. We had four tests going on to figure out this problem, right? Why was the customer satisfaction so low in every state and conversion? And it worked. And our conversion came back. We were able to even out the conversion and come to an average versus a huge max and min. But our DNA was data driven. And because of our big audience, we were able to test and test and iterate. And so we said, oh, wow, there's too much text explaining this problem. They don't need to know all the history of the, the world and, and, and legal in this. So we tested, hey, let's, let's get simpler. And so we just changed our message and it improved again. And we continued to iterate and watch, watch these tests and listen to the customer. And we made big impacts. And so in supply chain, it's, it's really complicated with 23 warehouses to move the goods front to back. So we tested the entire supply chain because the customer metric really was big selection and fast on time delivery. So we tested everything through the entire supply chain and through test after test after test, we were able to move that customer satisfaction up. So lifetime value is the, you know, the metric that you would see if you're improving the value of your service through these three needs. And every year we were able to improve it through all these different things that we did, discovery, recommendations, end-to-end, -end, testing UPS and FedEx. So we really listen to our customer through data. I shifted into sort of a B2B landscape and, and you know, I, I was lost, right? Where's my data, You're right? What, what do I do? Uh, you know, we have 30 customers, the product's not working. How, how do I go figure this out, right? And, and so, so what we learned that it's important to get into the mind of the customer when you have a low sample size like in B2B. You have to really think like your customer and in all aspects, you know, talk to your sales team, figure out what they think the customer needs. Talk to your ops team, your customer success, we called it. Talk to really understand and get into the mindset of the customer. Go talk to the customer, not just the buyer, but the people operating the tool and really understand what they need. So, so our problem was this great idea. Social commerce was gonna change the world. We built this feature. The feature went out, um, it didn't work. We, we did get sign up a lot of customers, but they couldn't run it. You know, they didn't have staff to run it. The product wasn't used by the customers. Like how many people buy something and then go share it to their Facebook account and say, I just bought this thing for my friend's birthday, right? Not many people are gonna do that because they want a surprise. So it really wasn't used. And of course, these customers couldn't pay us and it took a lot of time to onboard, integrate it, configure, sell it. So we had a fork in the road and we went and we went to listen to our customers and we didn't know how to do this. And so I was talking to somebody earlier, there you are, and, uh, and, and, and we really didn't know how to do it. You know, we were all from internet retail. We didn't know how to do B2B and talk to people. So what we did was um, we started responding to lots of RFPs. And the RFPs allowed us to really see what the industry wanted for where we wanted to go. And allowed us to get data and aggregate that data about the customer needs. And then we started figuring out how to respond to these things. And, and, and we went out and got in one some, thanks to our great salespeople and our great product people answering and messaging and figuring out the message. And we got to talk to the customers, right? Each RFP that we got into was about three conversations that we could have. There was like a business demo, a technical demo, uh, or set demo, the product demo. And then you got on the onsite and the onsite was where it happened. Um, and you could actually have a dinner with them, start listing their problems. And these aren't structured customer surveys, right? These are conversations. And in these conversations, you know, they start opening up to you and, and they say, you know, what is their real problem, right? And you'll be surprised with what they'll tell you. They'll tell you all the problems, right? What we learned was that the big brands, the big name brands that have the box stores right on this road, right? All their sales were shifting online, right? They didn't really care about the social loyalty that we had built. 
right? That was a, a delighter, just a little, in the Cano model, it was a delighter. It was just something that, that was like a, a little feature that was wow, but it wasn't their core problem. Their core problem was they didn't know who these customers were. They swiped the credit card and left, right? So how did they get to know them? And to get to know them was to sign them up and then interact with them. And so we changed our product and we worked really hard to figure out these onboarding and sign up flows to shift people online to their e-com store. The second problem was um, a lot of the brands sold through partners, which they didn't have control of the in-store experience. So, you know, we could change the boxes, we could change things, make it more interactive. So that's where mobile came in. Check, in, check in with the mobile store and really build interactivity and help them get to know their customer. But when you talk to your customers and build the relationships, sometimes they even give you a surprise. And so as we got to know some of our customers, we got to really learn that it wasn't just about to know their customer, they really wanted to be able to segment and, and figure out who was what and what did they need so they could really tailor the message. So we shifted again and got to a second pivot, which was learning what the customer's exact needs and segment, who they were. Um, this one customer showed me this typing thing, typing survey their research department did, and we said, aha, this is different, this is neat. We could take all this online, offline social data, bring it in, and we can start typing the customers so they can really get to know these customers. And we built it, and um, it took us quite a while. Uh, we, we iteratively built it and tested and learned along the way. But when we did that, we learned that we could expand out of retail and actually increase our market, right? Gaming was the same problem. You know, Pittsburgh Steelers, they can't talk to their customers because the NFL owns that right. Right? So with this engagement platform, they could actually start talking to the customer and figuring out what they needed to do and get them on to the field and do some interesting things and allowed us to expand out of our niche market. So when you make time to listen to your customer, one, you get to build a better mental model of who they are and what their needs are and what their true problems are, not just the problems you infer. You get to validate your problem statement and really make sure that you're on the right track. We were not. So we got to shift and you, you might find a hidden gem like we did. Of course, these two examples are pretty big extremes, right? When you have a big audience size, you can test and learn and test and learn and iterate quickly and get to sort of a customer product market fit. When you have a business application or maybe a, you're just starting out, you have to do the qualitative testing. In global trade, there's so many customers. I think when I first started here, somebody told me there was 55 personas we were designing for. Um, I added one more, the, the computer, which wasn't being thought of. Um, and, and it's just really complex, right? The, the goods in, uh, involve brokerage of discussion between the buyer, the supplier, trucking companies, the government, right? So many governments collect duties and tariffs and taxes. So the government's involved. It's definitely really interesting when Trump gets involved. So we have to talk to the customers. So somebody earlier in the talk was asking, how do we do it? We're still working on it, to be honest and truthful. It's hard, right? So you've got your sales team and we have a big sales team because this is a sold product. It's not a product led product. You have to get into these big enterprises and they're sometimes protective of their customer. They don't want you talking to them. So you really have to build trust with them and go meet your AEs and, and they'll take you, right? Once you get trust and they know that you're an expert, they will take you. They love to take the, the product people. Um, I just visited with one last week. Um, secondly, your operations team, they deal with them every day. So one of the tricks I've learned in this big corporate environment is you have to really get the trust of the operations team and they will take you to your customers. Um, the other thing we've done is we've, added product interests into our Salesforce system so that, and we've taught our product, our sales team how to qualify and ask things for us so we can get data on what we need to build. So things like, you know, do you need purchase order management? Do you need NetSuite integration? So they, they start collecting data for us. It's of course filtered data. Um, we have a design research team that's new and they go do structured customer investigations trying to really create personas for our customer. We've done a major shift from emerging to a mid-market customer who has very different needs. So our research team goes out and talks. This is actually one of the customers we talk to. 
Um, then of course, our product teams, they go talk to the customers. And sometimes, you know, we've got to redefine customer. We have a lot of complex internal things. So they talk to their internal business partners uh, many times. And of course, we utilize a lot of data insights. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to use all this cus um, customer-centered design thinking to really bring consumer-grade experiences to an ancient legacy trade and an enterprise platform. So this is sort of the output of our latest research. We wanted to upgrade our, our mapping feature. We were he hearing from operations that it was broken. It wasn't working. It didn't help me. So we went out, talked to the customers, and we aggregated all this data. And now it's really actionable, right? 14 shipments need attention. Seven just got updated instead of seeing all these things that they had to do. So we learned that from talking to many customers. Our, in, our customs teams who's actually right there, so hi, um, th they were building a huge uh, uh, effort, engineering effort to bridge human data entry with machine. And it's something you had to build. But then what did they do? They created an experiment, an A-B test on a small audience to test it, make sure it worked, and to also iterate on it. So this is a good example of blending the customer development with data to really make big improvements. Um, so I want everybody here, to, so a lot of hands went up, which is good, but I know myself, you get really bogged down in day-to-day -day and work, and, and sometimes you forget to go and talk to customers. Um, I did, right? I, I hadn't talked to the customer I talked to two weeks ago in eight months, right? It was really nice to go talk to them again and to hear the improvements we made and how it changed them and how it made us, them more sticky to us and more, you know, they wanted to expand their relationship with us. It felt good. So I, I want to call to action to everybody here uh, to, you know, get out from your day-to-day, -day, look at your calendar, make time to go talk to your customers. And I also want to call to action that we, we in this world, we hear about growth, all these different techniques for, for driving uh, uh, product, you know, and you have big audience size. You might test and learn, test and learn, test and learn. Uh, but in B2B, you might have to go talk and talk and talk. It's good to come up to scale and figure out a balanced approach of the two and make sure. So sometimes when we're test and learning, we don't look up and talk to our customer and we miss an innovation. We miss a, maybe a market pivot like we did here at Flexport on our shift from emerging to mid-market. Or we did at my, my other company where we were able to talk to our customer and get a new idea that got us out of our market. So make sure you have a balanced approach. And if you listen to your customer, you'll get to build a better mental model. You'll validate your problem statement and you just might find a hidden opportunity. So that's it for tonight. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I, I hope it was insightful. Um, when you have a product that um, you have very few customers on in a B2B scenario, maybe one or two and just trying to break the market, how do you balance between selling and learning? That is a tough question. Um, it, it's really hard, right? Because you're trying to get the revenue because you're trying to grow your customer. Um, I, I don't think there's a silver bullet. What we tried to do a, a lot at, at, at my old company was really think, would this custom thing that they're asking for be usable for other customers and we'd always go talk to other customers before we commit to anything right and, and so that that was sort of a balance kind of approach we, we usually built the things that were useful uh, for everybody and said no to some of the things that weren't and you know it's, it's a balance and it's an art to be honest here we've sort of focused on on on, on aggregating this data from sales so that we can uh, build the right thing in the right order instead of going over to the enterprise where we could have to do custom things. Um, so it's, a, it's really a balance and, and discipline. So, you know, at scale, you have to have the discipline, I think. Definitely. Jeff, thanks for this uh, question about having a global 
audience of very dispersed customers if you don't have that many of them, but they're all over the place. What's your insight into meeting face-to-face, -face, getting that high value face-to-face -face conversation versus on the phone or whatever else, uh, and the balance between getting insights from all over the world versus only in your geography? So, so it's, it's a tough, again, a balance. Um, at at, at the, the middle company, we would um, actually fly there because we would actually spend a lot of time learning. And so, you know, you, again, in, in the demos or the sales, you really wouldn't get as much nuggets because they were asking you and you were answering. But at the dinner or the other event, you could ask and you could start opening up. So when we were trying to find customers, we were also one of the things we opened up was global loyalty. We had to go there and we went to China all over the place. Here, um, we luckily have local presence where we can get that data from ops and, and start sourcing it and filter it. But our product management team and our engineering team, they go together as a group, product design engineering. They do field trips and they go. Um, so one of our PMs in here, he, he goes very often to, to talk to the shippers and spends two or three weeks out there in the field talking to the shippers. We're actually think we have to talk to the shippers so much we're actually building uh, a Chinese engineering office and product office to go and get closer to the shippers. We're calling it uh, the shipper love project. So, so it's, I think it's very important in a global company to make sure you get out there and talk to the global audience and not just your San Francisco audience. Hey, thanks for this. <clears throat> the, so this is a question based on the piece when you were talking about the maps and how you fixed it. So my question's on how do you go about thinking about prioritizing like operations focused, maybe like a quality of life project that might not have a tangible connection to company level metrics? Like how, what are your thoughts on that? How do you think about it in general? So, so I think that um, is really important in a company like this that's high, high operation need. Um, so so our, our supply teams spend a lot of time focusing on the quality of life of ops, you know, automating functions. You saw that in the customs ML project, right? That was an ops quality of life thing. It's also a data quality so that we could, you know, structure the data better and faster. Um, we, uh, we also send um, teams to go sit with ops in Asia to figure out how we can improve their, their life. But we also are doing that to structure the data better and, and make sure that the on-time performance, for example, the end-to-end -end is faster and tighter. So it, it, it's a high priority in our product roadmap. Um, it's actually one of the majority sections right now. So it's a great presentation. I have a very practical question. Uh, you have so many different clients, so many different people collecting and talking to clients. How do you practically approach collecting, documenting the insights to develop the product? So that's, um, that's something we're, we're working on. So we created a research group that is funneling a lot of this data in and collecting those insights and then sharing them back out. Um, but before we did that at scale, it was sort of the PM's big duty. And so the, the PM would go talk to the client, synthesize it, and figure out what to address. Um, and there's another, another angle on this, right? We'd hear a lot from ops, but those were always filtered things. You know, they would hear from the customer and it, you know, you have to use that a, a, as a guide, but not the law, and, and then go validate those issues yourself. And so the, that was a big part of the PM's duty is to go hear that and then be the voice of the customer and know what is important and what is not. So we're just starting building a research group um, that, that's gonna try to make it more systematic. Any other questions? All right. I, I actually have a question. So building on top of the question that this gentleman asked about sales versus research, um, there's definitely a few frameworks. So with, when you're doing sales, you're trying to convince people to do something. You're actually trying to anchor them or give them bias to make a decision. When you're doing research, you're trying to actually remove that bias and anchoring. And there's some frameworks like jobs to be done and, and other frameworks to do research to avoid the bias and anchoring. 
do you guys use any particular frameworks and if not, or what, what is your approach to that? Yeah, so, so different teams use different frameworks, but it's, it's, it's a lot of it's rooted in the design thinking and jobs to be done. Um, our, our research teams sometimes use uh, um, uh, cards and they, and they have the customer sorted on the table and really figure out what is the big problem by all these, these card sorting exercises. The second one we just did was a, a really interesting framework where we had these big picture ideas and they were called sacrificial concepts. And so we put them on the wall with different customers and they, they you know, said, I like that or I didn't like that. And they took them down until we got to a very good, interesting problem and it helped us sort and rank like their true needs. Um, so a lot of different frameworks are in use here. You, you don't just listen to the sales call. That's why we have the research and the product teams go out separately. Um, it's very important to, to not just be biased by the sales call. All right, great, thanks. Round of applause for Jeff. <clears throat> next, next up, we have uh, Matt, who's the uh, VP of product at Roblox, which is an amazing company, says my nine-year-old daughter who is obsessed with Roblox. And when I told her we have a speaker from Roblox, she wanted to come to the event and like take a picture with them. So I'm gonna have to get an autograph from you, Matt. Um, so, uh, so the, Matt's topic tonight is building a great product organization when the organization is your product. So basically applying product management principles to designing the, organi the product management organization. Um, so Matt is an experienced product leader who can drive strategic decisions while staying focused on implementation details. He has built successful marketplace platforms, enterprise SaaS applications, and multi multiplayer games by integrating customer feedback, data science, and common sense. Delivering complex products at scale requires multifaceted teams, and on numerous occasions, he's been able to assemble high-performing product engineering, analytics, business, and customer success teams from the ground up. And with that, I'll hand it over to Matt. Thank you. Um, thanks. Also, thanks to Flexport for having us this evening. Um, and thanks for coming out in the rain. I know when I drove up here, it was raining really hard, so I, I totally appreciate it. Um, before I get started, like a quick show of hands, like how many people know what Roblox is? So actually, this is pretty good. Like most of the time when like we go to events or we talk to people, um, Roblox is something that just a lot of people have never heard of. Um, so I'll start with just a quick intro of Roblox. Um, for those of you who haven't seen it or heard of it, uh, Roblox is a multiplayer game platform where we have a lot of kids on the platform who create these virtual experiences and then other kids come and play those experiences. So it's a marketplace, you know, we have content creators, we have content consumers. On the platform, there's a full virtual economy, there's a social network, there's a discovery engine, there's all kinds of stuff all happening together. Um, and that's what makes Roblox really unique is that, you know, Roblox is like dozens of startups all under one roof. And Roblox operates at scale. So today at Roblox, we have about 90 million uh, monthly active users. Um, trying to read my things here in the shade. Uh, and that, what that translates into is nearly 3 million people. Um, that's fine. 3 million people playing simultaneously when we get to a peak. Um, we have 57 million experiences that our, that our creators have made. Think of it again like kind of like a YouTube for gaming. And each month, we do about a billion hours of playtime. So a billion hours spent by kids on the platform. And what's really interesting for me is that, you know, with 90 million users, that means on average, kids are spending more than 10 hours a month on the platform. So it's super engaging. And it's grown pretty fast. Um, you know, here's a graph here shows you know, our monthly hours and stuff like that. It's a cool graph and I like the blue and everything. But the main reason I wanted to show it is because I showed up um, in the middle of 2017. And when I showed up, the company had already started to scale. It had already reached that product market fit. And so like, I wasn't there to like, you know, figure that out, but I came in afterwards. And when I showed up, um, the company was 250 people, but trying really, really hard to act like it was 100 people. We have a CEO who's like super visionary and like, the guy is just a genius but he was operating like there were a hundred people and mostly engineers and like he would walk around and say, hey, we need to build this, this and that. And then everybody would go and run and do it. And we had a product team 
and a development team that was mainly homegrown within the company. Uh, one interesting thing about Roblox is it's been around since like 2006. And so you saw that growth curve and, you know, in 2016, it really took off. But Roblox had been around for a long time before that. And the leadership within the product and engineering team was primarily homegrown. Uh, we looked at the product managers. They were people who started off in engineering, who decided to flip over to product. And even then, a lot of times it was their first job. So they'd never really seen anything from outside of the company. Um, and the same thing was true for the engineering leadership as well. And so, you know, we had the, at the time, there were maybe eight product managers, about 175 people in engineering. Um, there were 10 designers, but it was like a service organization. It was like, hey, I need a wireframe for this, or I need a mock-up for that. And they'd throw something over the fence and they'd wait for it to come back. And if it was good, it was great. If it wasn't good, if any of you played Roblox a few years ago, you know what it ended up looking like. Um, and then we had analytics and we had great independent analysts, which meant that they didn't really talk to each other. You'd ask like, hey, you know, are there best practices that you share? Or like, you know, are there standard design patterns for like how you go determine like, you know, play time or anything like that? And everybody would kind of have their own process. Sometimes they would share, sometimes not. And so I kind of walked into this and the only real direction I got was, we'll make it better and make it scale and figure out what to do. And Roblox is very much this environment where like you show up and people really trust that you know what to do. And then they kind of back off and they say, okay, go figure it out. So I want to talk a little bit about what we did because what I kind of started to figure out and it wasn't instantaneous, um, but I started to figure out that like you could actually treat an organization like the product. And I've done product for a long, long time. I started off in engineering. Um, and when you think about product and you think about building something for a customer that's out there and you know, you're figuring out like, how do I make money and appeal to the customers, it's very logical, but you don't always think about that with organizations. And what happens a lot with product teams is they really grow organically. And it turns into just like a reflection of who the original product team is or who the founders are. And what Roblox was really interesting because I walked in and it was like, okay, go figure out how we're gonna change it. And you know, just trying to figure out how to think about that. And one of the things that um, thinking about the organization as a product that brings up is that when you start talking about it that way, you just talk about goals and other things like that, it moves the conversation away from who owns what. And most product organization questions and discussions are all focused on, well, which part of the product do I own? And what am I going to give up? Or who are we going to hire to take over part of what I'm doing? And when you start thinking about it as a product, it provides the structure where it's not so personal anymore. So... We started with some first principles, um, a bit of an overused term, but I figured it was good here. Um, we started asking ourselves, you know, who is the customer of product? Like, who are we really serving? Uh, what problems are we trying to solve? And what are the guideposts that drive the organization? And I should be, you know, I'll be honest with this. A lot of this was really organic through lots of conversations. It's not like we sat down and had like a really structured conversation about this. But if we look at all of the work that we've done over the last couple of years, it really breaks down to these things. So first, who are the customers? Um, as a product team, we start off with like, the number one customer is actually the CEO and the board. Um, in a very vision-driven company, your job is to execute on that vision. Like, how do you take those ideas and operate those ideas at scale and execute? So that was customer number one. The next customer is the product team themselves, because as product teams scale, you need to figure out how you're gonna orchestrate across all the teams. And you have all these product managers who are super passionate about what they do, and they know how to do a lot of stuff, but like they need like some kind of orchestration that's going to make everybody fit and work together. The next thing, at least at Roblox and other places I've, I've worked at, it really falls on the product team to explain how you go from vision and you get that down to like a roadmap and execution down to like, what am I doing at work each day? And so a lot of teams end up relying on product to figure that out. Um, and they really go to the product team to say like, why exactly are we doing this? Even if I'm like in marketing or sales or whatever. And then we had customers. And um, for Roblox, it's, it's a unique situation. Um, we have 90 million players now. Um, we can't go talk to individual customers. I mean, we could, we, we have tours at our office and lots of kids come in, especially over the summer. It's kind of interesting, um, but it's really hard. And, and in particular, like talking to customers in the Bay Area is incredibly difficult because a lot of them grew up playing these games and they're very technology savvy. 
Um, but if we look at you know our customers as they're growing around the world, it's kind of hard to hard to do that in the Bay Area um, or even doing small focus groups. So you have to look at the data to really understand what's going on with the customers. Um, the other thing is our customers are also the internal teams. It's the marketing teams, customer service, uh, trust and safety teams, all of those things. Those are also our customers. So kind of think about all of that. The next was, what are the actual problems we're trying to solve? So again, a very product centric way of looking at things. Um, the first one we talked about, like actually from day one when I got there, we talked about how do you horizontally scale a product team? And Roblox is super engineering driven. You know, it's kind of like kind of a bit in the mold of like Google and some of these other places. And, you know, they're looking at like, okay, well, we can scale this product. We just add more servers and we're good to go. How do you do that with a product team? It's like, why can't you just go add more teams? And so I think when I got there, there were maybe like 15 teams. And the question kept coming up, like, what if we have 50 teams? What are we going to do? And so it's like, okay, like, okay, that, that seems like a good problem to try and solve. And it was actually based on this premise, which you could argue with, uh, more teams, more leaders, more horsepower. So if you have a really wide distributed team and it's horizontal, like you can keep bring in leader after leader and really like up the level of the entire team with that. Um, the next problem was if you got all these teams, how do you maximize the independence of those teams? Because what you can't have is like 50 product teams running around and everybody colliding with each other and everybody depended on what everyone was gonna do. So that was a problem, like how are we gonna solve that? Um, and the next was maybe again, a, a, a Roblox thing, but a real concern that we would oversteer into like either pro what product wanted to do or what engineering wanted to do or design or analytics. And the goal was how do we make sure that all of these teams really have an equal voice so the product is benefiting from all of these different inputs. Um, and Roblox, like when I got there, it was, more product driven and then like engineering got better and then became more engineering driven and it's gone back and forth and it's like how do we maintain this balance we said it's okay well we have these problems and what are like these guideposts that are gonna you know drive the product like how do we think about like some like core tenants that we can follow and then leverage those tenants to figure out like how do we actually build the organization and build all the infrastructure around it um, so the first one was organizing around the future and not the present and this is really hard. Like we started off and like, we did not have the product team that we needed. Um, we were missing a lot of people. Uh, we didn't have the design team. We didn't have the analytics team. And it's really easy when you get into those situations to say, okay, well, hey, wait, like let's wait till we hire the right people. And then as soon as the right people are here, then we'll set up the teams and everything's gonna be great. And the problem is when you do that, nobody thinks about where they're really headed. Everybody's focus is still on the right now. And so instead what we did, and it was kind of uncomfortable, like we would go to people and be like, you know what, we're splitting up your team. And yeah, we haven't hired the person yet, but we're going to, and we're gonna tell everybody about it. And we're gonna tell the people on the team, like, okay, now you're acting like you're multiple teams and like you should go sit together and do all of these things, even though there's like tons of TBHs and there are tons of people in acting roles. And, but it, as soon as you do it, like this magic happens. And the, the thing that, that's most valuable is the team start thinking like they're operating in the future. So your team start coming back to you and say, oh yeah, now that we're really thinking like this, this is who we should hire. And if you just bring people in and interview them before you do that, like the team doesn't really know what they're looking for. The person coming in doesn't really quite understand how they're gonna fit in. But if you just start organizing for the future, even with the dearth of people, it like helps correct that. The other thing we did on this is um, we created this notion of a product DNA, the DNA of a product manager, and we forced everybody to sit in a room and we outlined exactly what would make a product manager successful. And it was a great exercise and it's not like this epically long document, it's just like a one page outline, but we got everybody to agree on what the future was, even if we weren't there yet. And we put a lot of stuff in the DNA that it was impossible for us to achieve right now, um, but that was okay because it aligned all of us on where we were going in the future. That was one. Um, the next thing we did is, is like this guiding principle is um, this notion of organic alignment over top-down mandates. So we said from the very beginning, you know what? What we really want are teams and leaders to be able to make decisions on their own and come back and tell us what we should be doing rather than like having these really detailed lists of what every team is going to do. And that's really, it was 100% of that when I started. And obviously in like a vision driven company, there's still some of that top down stuff. But what we were hoping is that the teams would come back and like 
understand that there's like these really high level objectives that we're trying to get to. And the teams would come back and say, you know what, based on what my team is responsible for, this is what I'm gonna do. And we were even really clear that we, we do quarterly reviews. We have every team come in, we give each team 15 minutes, they talk about their roadmap, you know, we listen to it and all that stuff. And during that process, we made an agreement that if the teams were about 80% on target, 80% sort of aligned with the vision, we were good. And we we're just gonna let them go. And we were not gonna like micromanage those teams down to the minutia detail. We even told the teams, really, we only wanna know about like the three or four most important things you're working on. The other stuff, we're just gonna trust you. And at the beginning, I remember sitting through those reviews and you sit there and just like writing as fast as you can. Like, I can't believe this team is doing this. Like, what are they thinking? Why didn't they get the right input? Like, what's going on here? And after three or four quarters, you just sit there and you, and you like start like, just like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Like, that's a really good observation of what this team is doing. And then as a leader, you can step way back and start looking at like really thematic things that you need to focus on rather than being in the details. But it's hard to do this. Like you have to, you have to make a commitment to do it from the start. Um, the other thing, just in the details, it relies on teams understanding what their boundaries are. Uh, we operate with a MISI principle, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive for defining team boundaries. And we made sure all the teams understood that and that way that they didn't, they wouldn't collide with each other. Um, yeah, not with that. All right, agility over predictability. Um, you know, we learn a lot about what's going on from our customers and running a live service. You know, it's, it's running 24 hours a day. There's always millions of people on the platform. Um, it never stops. And so we said that, you know what, like predictability of a roadmap isn't nearly as important as making sure that we can have teams that make fast decisions. And so we started structuring things around that. And again, like we, we built it into the process and we said, you know what, teams, remember, quarterly reviews, tell us, you know, the three or four things that you're going to get done in the quarter. By the end of the quarter, if we can get like 70% of those things done, then we've won. And we're really clear that like if we drive the teams to 100% predictability, what we're going to get is sandbagging of schedules and a built-in reluctance to like be really agile. And so we were honest with everybody. We said like, this is our goal. And I remember like when I got there, it was like 50% and then it started rising and it started getting higher and we were like, wait a minute. Like this is dangerous. Like if it gets too high, we've oversteered. So we steer for about 70%. Um, the other thing we do is we extend this notion to how we, we, um, how we staff teams. So the teams are fixed because of that MISI principle. But if there are priorities in the company, we'll start shifting people around. And we'll say, you know what, your, your team, your roadmap does, you know, your team A over here and team B here, we might say, okay, we really have to kick ass on team B we'll push some people over to B, but we don't change anybody's roadmaps. Some of the roadmaps slow down, some of the roadmaps speed up, but we don't ask the teams to go and like rethink everything they're doing. We just try and figure out how we adjust resources to optimize. All right, the next is um, iterative development over formal releases. Um, we also decided that, you know, when you have all of these teams, when we started with how do you horizontally scale, if you've got all of these teams and they're all running, and like right now, I think we, we're doing like 400 simultaneous projects, like in our sort of project management system, um, there is no way to coordinate a massive release. Like in all of the things that Roblox wants to do, like the big stuff, like international, like, oh yeah, sure. Like what does international mean? Well, you've got to localize the product. You have to build data centers internationally. You have to make the tools capable so that our developers can localize their own content. We have to follow all these rules, like different countries have different you know, rules for what kids can do online. Um, that touches a huge swath of teams. And if you say that like, we're gonna to build to this magic moment where like, we're gonna snap our fingers and make a big release happen, it's really hard to like, go with that horizontally scale principle. So we said, all right, you know what? Everything is iterative, stuff's going out all the time. Our customers are gonna find out about stuff before we announce it. Our customers actually, within those 90 million kids, there's the kids that reverse engineer the, the binaries that we send out, look at all the APIs and then publish them. So way before we launch any feature, like the community already knows exactly what we're doing. And we just said, you know what? We're gonna embrace that. That is part of our launch plan. Our launch plan begins when somebody reverse engineers the binary and figures out what we're doing. And, you know, it, it works. Um, that doesn't work, you know, for enterprise software companies or for companies that really rely on press cycles. But for us, it was like this important principle that let us scale. 
next, we said transparency over mandates. So um, I'm trying to think of a good one recently. Uh, we've been focused a lot around security about monetization. We have this great virtual economy. Kids buy a virtual currency. They spend it in games. The money goes to the developer. The developer takes that virtual currency and they can cash it out. And this year, I think we'll probably pay the, the developers like $100 million. So it's a, it's a pretty vibrant economy there. Um, we have security issues. And our monetization team came and said, okay, hey, we're seeing all of these different issues in the system where different exploits, um, internal exploits, uh, external exploits. And we said, you know, one thing that we could do is we could stand up in front of all the product teams and we say, stop everything. Everybody has to lock down all their stuff. And instead, the way Roblox has chosen to operate is we surface data about those issues. We surface data about scalability risk, cost to serve, how many critical issues are on the platform, how many critical UX issues are on the platform. Um, are you tracking your metrics? And we just have a dashboard called the transparency dashboard. And we put it out there and we let all the teams see it. And you know, it's this natural competition happens. And it is a little bit of like social engineering your product team, um, but it works. And if anything, we have to get people to like chill out because they see stuff and it's like, oh my God, I'm at the bottom of the list. Like, what are we going to do? And you're like, wait a minute. Like, that's okay. We're going to help everybody improve. And different teams have different priorities. For monetization, security was a huge issue, but for other teams, not maybe not as much. Um, but so we said, okay, transparency over trying to get these top line mandates. Um, the next is like tools and process matter. Like you have all of these things and we build tooling and process that reinforces all of this stuff. So when we think about like, what are these guideposts that feeds into our tooling? So for example, we have a whole system to track all the milestones that everybody's working on and we do them quarterly. And one of the questions we get from a lot of people who come in as new product managers is, well, where's the Gantt chart with all the different dependencies and like all of these different things that we can track. So if something slips, we know we're like, we just don't do it. Because if we did that, that would kind of like push against our whole agility thing. So we're not gonna do stuff like that. Um, and so like when you think about tooling and process and all that stuff, like you have to build it to match your principles. Um, the last thing is taking the long view. Um, and we said from the very beginning, or at least when I got there, but the company has been doing this for a long time. So it's not just when I got there. Um, we said that we would take like near term, like lack of you know, alignment or near term inefficiencies if we were building towards the long term. And that comes down to like how we hire, how we build and how we structure how the team operates. And you know what, it's super frustrating sometimes because like the leadership team and the board is like, why isn't this done? Why isn't this done? Um, and sometimes we have to go back and just be like, you know what, like we, we couldn't find the right people to hire or we found this problem when we decided, you know, we're gonna take a lot longer to, to do it. And there's a lot of those discussions happening, but we have to like reinforce it all the time. Um, and again, like tools and process have to like reinforce that. One of the things that, that we also started doing is we kind of thought of these things as roadmaps. Like, so each of those principles has a roadmap, like transparency, like the first transparency dashboard that we did was really how many projects did people have that were like on time? And we just did that and it was like, okay, well, we'll try and get to 70%. That's good. And then we just kept thinking like, what are all the things that we would add to it over time? And there's a lot of stuff in it right now, but like we just, we just hired a new um, head of uh, corporate security or IT sec. And I was talking to her on Monday and we're like, you know, we should add security to this because then we should like inform everybody about like security issues. Um, and like in hiring, we have like a dashboard on like, you know, transparency around attrition and things like that. And like all of these things, it's, it's a product roadmap. It's, it's no different. The other thing I guess, all this stuff took a lot of time. Um, and so nothing happened overnight and we, we've learned a lot of stuff on the way. So like, just like you learn stuff on roadmaps, it's, it's the same thing, but you can have these organization roadmaps and you can think about how things progress in the future. So 18 months later, I would say we're way more confident in our direction and we're way more self-aware at how hard it is to do some of this stuff. I think at the beginning we thought, oh, it'll be easy. We had the spreadsheet. Well, like, I remember, like I had only been there for a few months and it was over like a winter holiday or whatever. And we were sending spreadsheets around how we were gonna reorganize the whole team and it was gonna be awesome. And that was about 18 months ago. 
and it, it takes a long time. And I was looking back at each of those things and like we learned a whole lot through each of those iterations. Um, but I look at some of the original stuff and what occurs to me, it was like, it was the MVP of what we were trying to do. So how far have we come? Um, the company's about doubled in size. So we've gone up to about 500 people. Um, the product team has increased by a factor of three. So I think we went from like eight product managers to about 25 now. Um, design was up by a factor of three. Analytics is up by a factor of three. We also redid our entire, like how we think about design and analytics and we matrixed those teams so that designers and analysts are like sitting with all of the teams that they, they're responsible for supporting. Um, and uh, we rebuilt our whole analytics, like thought of how we're gonna build analytics. We're trying to build the infrastructure there. Jeff, who's here, is helping to build some of that stuff. Um, but we really can't come a long way. And now I think like when we look at it, like when I got there, it was this company was trying really hard to be the 100 person startup, even though they weren't. And now I think like we're this company that's like pretty confident we can grow to about a thousand people and it's predominantly product and engineering. What happens after that, we don't know. And a lot of like, a lot of the thinking that's happening now and actually one of the reasons why I wanted to start doing talks like this is we're trying to figure out what happens after a thousand um, because we have to start building that roadmap now. That's it. So, thank you. Oh, I forgot to say what's next. Yeah, so we're figuring out how do we go, um, go into the future. We're calling it like an operation manual. You know, it's like when you get a new a person who starts, you know, hand them the operational manual for how the team operates. We're also trying to d define like standard interfaces between teams and figure out how to scale stuff. So. Um, that was a wonderful talk. Thanks for that. Uh, one question that I wanted to ask was in the previous talk, there were lots of um, mention of talking to the customer by the product team. And you mentioned that a lot as well. What do you think is the difference or like how do product managers and product designers work at Roblox together and what, what are their uh, differences in their responsibilities? All right, so I'll, I'll talk first about talking to the customer. Roblox is in this unique situation. Um, it's not unique, but large scale consumer products. Um, we like listening to customers has to be around metrics. Um, we have this thing that we, the, the, the product team is constantly reminded of is, although we get feedback on Twitter or in forums or other things like that, um, it's a constant reminder to the product team that a fraction of a percent of our users would ever look at Twitter or look at forums or anything like that. And we just have to keep reminding ourselves of that. It's a little bit different on our, the product teams that are working on tools that our developers are using because we have, um, we, we have, I guess, like they're kind of like enterprise customers over there, but for like our consumers and players, it's a little bit different. Um, so we really try on focus on metrics and that's been something that's been super frustrating um, as we're trying to like build up the, the capability on the metric side and analytics side in order to be able to answer those questions. And it's taken a lot longer than, than we wanted it to. Um, so I guess that's the answer to your first question. Um, on the second question about dividing up responsibilities, we look at each of the teams and we run about 25 product teams right now, um, spread across lots of, obviously lots of different disciplines. Um, our goal is for most of those teams to have a product lead a design lead, an analytics lead, um, and an engineering lead. And we try really, really hard to make sure that we're not like singling any one of them out as the leader of the team. Like we try and like strike as much balance as possible. And part of it is because it creates more opportunities for leadership. Um, obviously like different teams have different, you know, um, strengths and weaknesses and stuff like that. Um, design, we are pushing really hard towards our designers playing a way more active role in product definition. When we started, design was something that like product would figure something out, hand it to the designers and say, you know, make it pretty, they would get it back and implement it. Um, we're really trying to change that. So actually a lot of our core product work around like the, our application, like how discovery happens, um, a lot of that is, is turning into be much more design driven. Um, and looking at like aspirational designs. And then the product team takes that and says, okay, well, if you wanna do that, like how would we actually build it? And what are all the different issues we have to contend with? So we're trying to get the design to take a way more active role. Uh, 
Hi, thank you. My name is Suman. And when you were presenting your talk, I was thinking you are just presenting me because right now I am uh, with my team. I'm doing the Office 365 migration to the cloud. And we have a, like a six squad and we have a product owner, Scrum Master, Tech Lead. And definitely every day is very challenging. How you keep yourself is motivated because I was also thinking it's not a one day kind of a thing or couple of months. It's a whole the roadmap about the even company perspective for the senior management perspective. And then how you are keeping yourself aligned to that vision and keep yourself motivated, particularly at the senior management level. Definitely the teams make mistake. You feel frustrated. Means at the higher level, how you keep yourself? That's my question. Thank you. Um, let's see. How do you keep myself motivated? Um, the most motivating thing is when we bring on new leaders, so we get new teams running, and they become self-sufficient. And um, part of it is like really learning to kind of like one, be super excited about that, and let go and realize that there's always like other very hard problems to solve and just trying to constantly ask myself, um, you know, I can get into the detail, but how do you bring people in or how do you create organizations that let you step back? And so like one of our, like our sort of aha moments was we used to do these quarterly reviews and um, like the teams would spend so much time preparing for it and trying to like, get everything right. And then we, we implemented an infrastructure where like the quarterly review, it's basically like, we just have a dashboard and like people pre prepare a nice presentation, but we can just look at the dashboard and talk about it. And like, as soon as you can get to points like that, then it like, it's like this constant unlocking, you know, you've, you've unlocked the ability to have like much deeper discussions about, you know, where their company's going and things like that. Um, so like when you figure out like these different organizational principles or you implement some systems, um, it just, creates opportunities to do a lot of more really cool stuff. Um, as far as like remaining aligned, um, I mean, I credit like our, like our founder CEO. I mean, he, he's very good at like being able to say like, this is what I think we should do. Um, and, you know, working with everybody to get them to understand. Um, and so I think he, he does a lot of that. And to be honest, like this like horizontally scaled product team, most of what the, like myself and the, some of the other leaders do, it's orchestration. Like we are not there to like espouse the vision and get everybody to figure it out. Like we are there to make sure that all these teams align and figure out what they're doing and how do they execute as efficiently as they can. Um, because we have a founder who's really good at like telling the vision. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, I, w I was gonna ask uh, how you, how you had the confidence and faith in this change from the beginning where you had the spreadsheets and you're trying to do it quickly. Um, but then that sort of, so you might talk about that, but I also evolved into the question of how much do you recommend this outward to say mm, other teams might want to try this or was it really unique to your CEO and your situation? Um, I'll start with, I think that the guideposts are unique. Like, I mean, I think there's probably, you know, a few dozen guideposts you could probably choose from and pick and choose and decide what's best for your, your team. Like I've run enterprise software. Um, I've done, you know, B2B, B2C. I, I've done a bunch of stuff and it, like there's stuff that's unique to Roblox, but I don't think that those guideposts are things that like you wouldn't see in a lot of other places. Maybe they would be mixed up a little bit differently. Um, I say the confidence to do some of this stuff, like, you know, when I, when I got there, it was unique because it, it, th there was only room to improve. And uh, Roblox is a pretty empowering place where like if, if, if you can get stuff moving in the right direction, um, people will step back and, and let you do it. And it goes back to like some of these core ethos about horizontally scaling teams. Like the only way it works is to give people an opportunity to do it. Um, it also means that like there's pretty rapid feedback if things are going way off course. Um, and we will figure out what to do if that happens. Um, but it, you know, it, it couldn't be worse. And they hired me to do it. So it's like, I might as well try. So that's good. Thanks. Anyone else? Thanks. Can you talk a little more about uh, the like, 
process of Hold it a little away from you. Can you talk a little bit more about the my deep baritone? Uh, can you talk a little more about the process of like finding the meaning for your individual team? Yeah, how do we define MISI for the individual teams? Um, I didn't even know that this was like a, a, a thing, a term, until our CFO was like, oh, it's MISI. And I was like, what are you talking about? Um, so mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. Um, Roblox, we call it a very massive product surface area. We have a game engine, we've got developer tools, a social network, a search engine, uh, a virtual economy, a whole trust and safety thing. Um, kids chat with each other. Um, I don't know, there's a lot of other stuff. We run our own data centers, like it's just all over the place. And so we basically said that unless we were very clear that like teams owned like the entire product and you always knew where to go to, that it was gonna be a disaster. And we have these big initiatives, like international, big initiative. And there was a time where people are like, I know we should just have a massive international team and we should have a massive team on like making it so that we can build deeper, um, richer experiences. But you look at it and the teams just like totally overlay on top of each other. And we're like, that would just be a mess. Um, and we run really thin. I mean, there's a lot of people there, but the, the product is very vast. So um, it's not like there's a lot of depth in all of the different engineering teams. And so we looked at it and you know, it was engineering driven predominantly. And we just said, okay, where does it make sense to draw the boundaries? Uh, there were some nuances with how product maybe pushed it in certain ways, but we kind of just embraced like the engineeringness of it and it worked. Uh, this is quite a bit of operational change uh, there. Uh, like the, the process changes, were they split between your PMs? Did you end up creating like product operations team or anything like that? So right now, um, I and I get a support, like half of a admin are the product operations team. And so um, we had to figure out how to scale it and, and stuff like that. Um, so it was a lot of kind of hacking things together. But so one, one thing that's funny about Roblox and actually Jeff is the one who told me this is like new people who come to Roblox look around and be like, oh my God, there's no process. And the people who have been at Roblox for a long time are like, oh, there's so much process. Um, so we try and run super process light and we have this, this notion that there's this common uh, operating interface between all the teams and it's pretty thin, but then we encourage the teams, each of the teams, like they run their own scrums. If they want to do like Kanban or they want to do agile, like whatever, um, they run on their own release schedules. Like every team really like operates as independently as possible so that like that common like process that we have to all agree to is as thin as possible. We also have this notion of like an operational cadence where we say, okay, we have teams that are operating at very different, you know, speeds and stuff like that. Um, but we agree that like once a quarter, we're going to do a check-in and we agree that every month teams do like, a stakeholder meeting and they publish all their notes for it. And we agree that um, you're never more than two days away from having, um, bringing people together to make hard decisions, including our CEO. And so our CEO, like, like it's the mandate of like him and like the, the team that works around him that if we need to have like key like product decisions, everything else can be pushed back. And we do that so that like the teams can go as fast as they, as fast as possible and that you can make lots of decisions quickly um, and actually iteratively. So you're not building up to these like giant decision points, um, which then creates its own process. So we, we call them office hours and like you can go to office hours, you, we schedule in like five and 10 minute increments sometimes. And you go in there and you'd be like, I wanna talk about this for five, 10 minutes, maybe 30 minutes if it's a big topic, we'll pull the right people in there. We have a timer that sits on the table that counts down so people know how much time is left. And we just like hammer through issues really fast. And it creates, um, it actually minimizes process um, because we don't let things bubble up into big decisions. I, um, so you mentioned that your CEO is also very much a visionary and sometimes also tap on the engineer's shoulder and say, hey, this is what we do. 
Um, and I wonder how did you how did you come in and change the organizational culture in terms of how founder and engineering team work with um, across functionally and how, what are the challenges you faced? All right, so the first thing I learned when I got there was what my predecessors had tried and it hadn't worked out very well. And there were, there were a number of predecessors. Um, and they, 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 the people came in and they're like, I know what we should do. Like we should run like a more traditional company and we should change how everything operates. And like Dave, who's the CEO, he needs to like step back and be more of a CEO. I'm not sure what that means. And um, like, I was like, you know what? Like you can't argue with the company and the product that had scaled as much as it had even when I got there. And so I was like, let's just embrace what it is. Like you have the CEO who's like very visionary. He is like the chief product officer and let's build around that. So that's like when we said, okay, we want to horizontally scale teams. Um, I said, great, we need to do this office hour thing so people can get in front of you all the time because you can't like set up one-on-ones with everybody. Like that's never going to work. And so we really just started structuring around the strengths of like what he did. And I, I think um, it's created a, a I, I keep saying unique. I haven't found other places that are quite like it, um, but I'm sure that there are some out there. Um, but I think it's, it's created a good culture and the process and all of these things are built around those strengths. And the same thing, like we've built around the strengths of a very engineering driven culture. Um, we've built around the strengths of, um, you know, a community that, you know, reverse engineers our binaries and like, you know, tells us what we're gonna launch way before we ever are gonna get there. And so instead of trying to push back against it, we just sort of embraced it. Okay, one more hand in the middle. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. What do you think are gonna be the biggest challenges once you've scaled beyond a thousand with the framework that you've put together? I think the problem, the, the, the biggest challenge right now is the velocity of stuff that's gonna get done. Like we can see like the velocity of how much work gets done is dramatically picked up in the last year. Um, and a lot of that is like around process and like some of the tooling and stuff like that. I think that um, we need to train the next product leaders so that they're very good at taking a lot of like minutia detail and up leveling it into like some more like core themes that we have to decide on. And like, we have to get, figure out how we like up level everybody to do that. Um, because I still think we spend too much time um, talking about really detailed stuff that we should be able to leave to these product teams to do. Um, but we don't necessarily have all the product leads in place who can like sit there and step back and say, you know what, what we're really arguing about here is not the placement of a button on the page or something like that. It's our philosophy on how we pay developers or like our philosophy on like, you know, what is our relationship with, you know, trust and safety with the end user, not like what's the color of a warning message that shows up in chat. And we have to figure out how to up level those teams. Part of that is that our, our product leaders now are super thinly resourced. And so each of those teams, we need to build another layer of product in them. Um, like I said, there's like 25 teams, say a third of them are infrastructure teams that don't have product managers, but we only have like 25 product managers. And there's a whole new layer that we need to bring in in order to up level the conversations because people just don't have time to think about it. Anybody else? All right. Yeah, so I'm just curious on the, um, when you said that the, the teams are structured with both the design engineering product lead. Uh, when it comes to design, is there also a um, more centralized group to keep, keep uh, together like a design system or you just within, is there a um, or overarching system within the design organization and, and this product communicate with that as well? Or is that just kept within design? Um. So we try and actually push it out to one team. Um, we're building, so Roblox runs on um, lots of platforms, iOS, Android, PC, Mac, Xbox, hopefully some other consoles in the future. Um, and so we're building our own version of sort of like Google material design and all the building blocks. So we have a team that's responsible for that. 
And so what we did is we said, okay, that team then is responsible for sort of the UI cohesion, um, but it's really driven by our head of design. Um, but we have that team saying, okay, we're gonna build the basic building blocks that we expect everybody else to follow. And then what we do on the transparency side is, um, is we want the design team to call out other teams that are like deviating from that standard. And like, we hopefully get to a point where like, there's just this dashboard that's like, okay, here are these things that are deviating and the teams will self-correct. So. Hey Matt, um, so as a product leader, you know, and you have this MISI, right? And you have split up teams, right? And, and it sounds perfect, but then this big opportunity comes that's going to be a horizontal across, sort of like your international problem. How do you um, really make that decision on who's going to own what or, you know, let the, let the team down, right, and, and really come to this decision? You know, we have these fast decision meetings, too, and, and some decisions just shouldn't be fast, and you've got to really think about it. How, how do you balance those two? So there's probably another product talk in here. Um, so, uh, so here's what we do. Um, this, I didn't put it in here. I wasn't sure quite how it would fit. Um, but we have this notion of like high level product objectives. Um, we call them arcs, sort of like a story arc, plot arc, think about a movie. And I, I like the word arc because arcs move and they, they, they have a, their own timeline and they change over time and stuff like that. And, and these things aren't like an objective. It's not, don't, it's not about get to this metric. Um, like international, it's not about a metric, it's about like how do we make sure that our creator community and player community is really robust around the world and there's all kinds of stuff in there. And so what we do is the, the, we, we um, as a leadership team said, okay, what are those arcs? And we came up with, um, came up with like about eight of them. And we said, okay, for each one of them, we're going to treat them like a product. There's a mission, there's objectives, and there's a roadmap we'd like to attain. And with each one of them, we figured out all this stuff. And then we said, even there's an arc leader, somebody's in charge of that, but they have no resources. There's no teams assigned to each of those arcs. Um, it doesn't define reporting structure, but it's, it's like a template, uh, you know, it's sort of like a guidebook. And we put those together and we give them to all of the teams and we say, okay, here's your guidebook. What is your roadmap? And then the teams would come back and say, okay, well, I think that I can contribute most to like that arc, that arc, but I can't do anything over here. So my roadmap's gonna attack these two. And um, it's evolved a little bit um, where we now prioritize them and we talk about like the most important ones. And we think that uh, probably on a yearly cadence, we as a leadership team will say, okay, this is, this is what's really important. And so we have like a three to five year roadmap for the company. And the roadmap for the company is like a one pager that just lists which arcs we would do in what year. And that's pretty much it. And then we let the teams go from there, but we do give a lot more thought to the high level. 